Welcome to the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency Courtesy Training. Today, we will be talking about state-specific requirements as it relates to compliance with the tax credit program in North Carolina. At the end of our presentation, we'll also go over some other recommended practice practices as well. Your presenters today will be Sandy Harris and Stephen James. We'll rotate throughout the presentation. First, we'll cover some hot topics and reminders. Of course, everyone's familiar with COVID-19 and the impact it's had on our everyday lives as well as everyday business. We encourage you to keep constant check of our website because that is where we're posting our updates as it relates to file reviews, physical inspections, any eviction moratoriums, things of that nature. So just keep a check on our website for that information. Some additional resources that you will also be able to um, locate are the income and asset calculation examples. We typically have those when we meet in class. We have made those available as well. The instructions for the vacancy and referral system, management company resources as it relates to RCRS, fair housing, which is very important. We make that information available. Also, our agency does many other things other than just the tax credit and home programs. We offer first-time home buyer resources such as down payment assistance, low interest rate mortgages. We also do urgent repair loans. People um, own their home and they can't afford to make repairs. They can come to our agency to qualify to get money to make those repairs. We also provide a cheat sheet of acronyms. So when you're dealing with our agency staff and other people in the business and they're referring to things that they're using an acronym, it'll help you better understand what they're talking about. And we've also provided the HUD handbook as it relates to chapter five and appendix three to help you know how you should be determining income and calculating rent as well as acceptable forms and verifications. You also need to make sure that you're doing your um, annual owner certification, which is due February the 10th of every year. Make sure that you're doing that timely because if not, we will be issuing an 8823 for that. This is a screenshot of what it looks like in RCRS if you go in to see the status of your annual owner cert. If you have any questions about the annual owner certification, you should reach out to Tanya Clark or to Lisa White. In order to manage properties in North Carolina, you do have to be on the approved management company list. If you have any open non-compliance, that will prohibit you from being on the approved management company list unless there is an approved action plan for that non-compliance. If you have a loan from our agency, which we'll talk more about later, you do have to get our permission to increase the rents on the property. If you increase rents without our permission, we will um, possibly remove you from the approved management company list. So just make sure that you're following procedures as is laid out in the loan agreement to get our approval for rent increases. The state tax credit program um, is now known as the Workforce Housing Loan Program. In the past, we monitored your property every three years as relates to file reviews, and we did physical inspections every year. In an effort to align with the new monitoring requirements established by the IRS, we are now doing files and physicals every year. So there will not be a difference. We will be there every year doing your file reviews and your physical inspections. 8609 is your money form. That's the form that we issue to a developer when they get credits from our agency. They then fill out the part two of that form and submit it to the IRS with their tax returns. Once the owner has filled out part two of the 8609 and signed it, they need to upload it in RCRS so we can have a copy of that form. That helps us determine how we should monitor your property. So make sure that we get that form and make sure that you're doing that timely because if we come out to do a review of your property and the form is not in our system, we will cite you for non-compliance. Annually, um, we, if we update any forms, we post those on our website. The revised forms as of February the 1st of 2020 are listed here. Keep in mind, for any new move-ins as of February the 1st, you should be using these forms, and any recertifications after June the 1st, you should be using these forms. 
I do want to point out the tenant income certification you can generate from RCRS. The one that generates from RCRS will not be updated until January the 1st of 2021. If the RCRS generated tick is the form that you use, we will not cite you for non-compliance. But if you're using the one that's on our website that you print and complete by hand, we will cite you for non-compliance if you're using an older version. The inspection protocol change um, is well, scheduled for um, late this year, beginning of next year, 2021, going to Inspire. You know, we currently use the UPCS. There, and now we currently have five inspectable areas. Once they make the change to Inspire, there will be three inspectable areas. And you'll notice that more um, focus will be on the dwelling units. That'll be 50% of your inspection. Once we get more information about this and know when it is going to be actually put in place and rolled out, we'll share that information with you. But we did want to give you a heads up that that is coming. Beginning January the 1st of 2019, management companies are required to do the mandatory tax credit lease addendum for all of their units. Make sure that you are doing this for all new move-ins. Also, we're not reviewing your actual lease now. We're just looking to make sure that you have this tax credit lease addendum. If you have RD or HUD funding on your property, we did make allowances in that addendum to cover those. But again, all households must sign this lease addendum. In June of 2019, we put in place the home lease addendum. All new leases need to be signing the home lease addendum. Regardless of the number of home units you have at your property, all units must complete the home lease addendum because the units are expected to float. Our attorney drafted this lease addendum so we will no longer be approving your lease. When you have a lease that we have to approve, when you have home funds, you need to upload your lease as well as this addendum. As long as you include this lease addendum, we will approve it. Borrower requirements, which is the Violence Against Women's Act. When we come out to do our physical inspection, we are making sure that you are complying with that. We're gonna make sure that you have your emergency transfer plan posted and that it is available. And we're also going to make sure that you're giving the correct forms to any new tenants or you're letting any applicants know the information that they need to be made aware of. What we're going to do is ask your on-site staff of the forms that they use. Provided they can show us those forms, we will know that the property is in compliance with VAWA. If it appears that the site staff does not know which forms they're supposed to be using, um, or maybe it's someone that's new and they're not familiar with the VAWA, we'll ask them for the most recent move-in file. Provided that we have the, um, you have the information in your files, we will look and confirm. And if so, we'll document that the property is in compliance. Should the property not be using the forms or the management company is not able to provide the forms, we will note that as non-compliant. So just make sure that your site staff are familiar with VAWA. For those of you that have targeted units on your property, you may also receive key rental assistance. Effective January the 1st of 2019, DHHS will no longer allow payment for key subsidy for unit events that exceed 12 months. So for example, if you submit a requisition in January of 2020 for 12 months, or for, excuse me, for 14 months, and that's say November the 28th of 2018 to December of 2019, you will not receive payment for November and December because that is outside the 12 month window. So make sure that you are submitting those payments timely. Now we're gonna talk about tax credit specific requirements and state requirements. Supportive services plan was, if it was originally required on your property when the property was allocated credits, you need to make sure that you're continuing to follow that. If the plan's not relevant or needs to be updated to reflect current activities, we encourage you to submit a copy of that to our agency. We'll review it and make sure that the property is in compliance. And some of the things that we check when we're out doing inspections of your property to ensure that you're following that plan is looking at your services notebook, any flyers that you've made, any sign-in sheets, or any calendars that you've posted for the month. 
each property has to follow the QAP that was in place at the time the credits were allocated, regardless of how the, QS, the QAP has evolved. For example, a property that was allocated credits in 2000, 2001, supportive services was mandatory for the elderly in special populations, but it did not apply for your other properties. You'll notice in 2003, supportive services is no longer required but you got optional points to participate in the targeting program. So it's very important that your site staff know when the property was allocated credits so they'll know how the property will be monitored. The targeting program is a partnership between DHHS, our agency, and local communities. And annually, 10% of any newly funded um, low-income housing credit deal is targeted to persons with disabilities. There is a um, targeted unit agreement that is entered into, and the households must be referred by a service provider who's made a commitment to participate. And the housing, housing has to have access to supports and services, but it does not require that those be provided on site. There is some key rental assistance available. The key rental assistance is state-funded operating assistance to subsidize the rents of the households referred by DHHS. It is limited to households headed by persons with disability, which can be verified by an income based on a disability, such as SSI, SSDI. The key payment standard is set by NCHFA and DHHS. And the owners also must sign an agreement of participation. Management is responsible to verify eligibility and to request monthly key requisitions, and also to transition to Section 8 voucher in RCRS if that is applicable. Income averaging is only allowed for allocations in 2019 and forward. All requirements are spelled out in the Qualified Allocation Plan or the QAP. And the following slides are going to contain just some of the very basics. Applicants electing to use income averaging have to comply with the following. The average income for the property and the income average for any bedroom type cannot exceed 60%. Market rate units are prohibited. And for projects with more than one building, owners must select each building to be part of a multiple building set aside on line 8B of the IRS form 8609. No project can have more than four income bands. They can consist of 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, or 80 area median income. And any project utilizing income averaging has to pay a monitoring fee of $1,200 per unit in 2019, and that does increase to $1,500 in 2020. And it also includes all units, qualified, unrestricted, and employee units, and must be paid prior to the issue of the 8609. Some of the compliance monitoring requirements are is that the designations must float. Income and rent designations are required to float to maintain compliance with set-asides specified in the application. All tenants must be certified annually. And essentially, we're going to do that to confirm that the appropriate unit set-aside is, is met. And there's no exception allowed for 100% low-income projects using average income as the minimum set-aside. There are going to be annual tenant file reviews by our agency which means we're going to um, increase the number of annual reviews to ensure compliance. There's going to be lower income and rent limits. So the lower set asides must follow the multifamily tax subsidy program income and rent limits that are published by HUD. And any units where income or rent exceeds the limits set aside um, and approved by HUD will be reported to the IRS. Of course, the IRS is the compliance enforcement and it we report to them annually as it relates to when we test the annual average income requirements in a unit out of compliance at year end regardless of whether it's attributable to a low income certification or a physical inspection issue will be removed from the applicable fraction to determine if the average income is acceptable so again it's important that not only are your units in compliance as it relates to the physical aspect of the property but also as it relates to income and rents
All right, so now we're going to talk about the rents, the fees, and the utility allowances. Um, with RPP loans and other agency financing, the agency must approve your rent increases. And the rents are generally set under the applicable rent limits. Rents charged cannot exceed the agency approved amounts, even if the rental charge charges uh, comply with the rent limits. If you need assistance on how to submit a rent increase, they're in RCRS under the announcements and scroll up and go back to um, March the 7th, 2014, when these instructions were published in RCRS. Also, if you have questions, Randa McCauley um, is our contact person. That's her focus area is with the rents and her email address is provided down at the bottom of the screen. Utility allowances, of course, utility allowances include all the utilities paid directly by the tenant and not through the owner. Um, the owner cannot build tenants for utilities based on unit size, number of the household members, or the general allocations where conserv conservation efforts by the household do not reduce the bill. And the owner can separately build tenants for utilities if the units are sub-metered. Requirements for all methodologies that are used. The utility allowance must be updated annually and it must be uploaded in RCRS. With each request, all utility allowance types must be load, uploaded in RCRS with the cover letter indicating the utility type and the effective date. The agency staff will enter the utility allowance for use by the property in RCRS and we do not have the ability to enter different utility effective dates based on the type. If you have questions or need assistance with submitting or working on your utility allowance, our contact person is Teresa McSorley. That's her focus area. And her email address is also provided here at the bottom of the screen. The agency is responsible for reviewing and evaluating and approving and executes the utility allowance certification within 30 days of the receipt of the information. So once it's been submitted in RCRS, um, you should receive a response, either approval or being returned because there's an issue with it within 30 days. If you have to submit your utility allowance again for approval, just keep in mind that that 30 day clock starts again once you've resubmitted it in RCRS. Requests can be submitted at any time during the year, so you don't have to wait until it expires. Rent increases will not be approved without proper utility allowance certification. So keep that in mind that when you're submitting your rent increases for approval, your utility allowance certification needs to be up to date. The regulation on our policies and where we arrive from those can be found on the IRS website and the website there is published. And also our agency guidelines can be found on our website nchfa.com under the policies and procedures. Owners were not required to update or implement utility allowances until the building has achieved 90% occupancy or 90 day period or at the end of the first year of the credit period, whichever is first. And then changes prior to the final cost cert must be approved by the development underwriters. Owners are allowed to switch utility allowance methodologies from year to year. And owners must pay all the costs incurred in obtaining and providing the estimates to the res residents and the agency. With the exception of HUD regulated and rural housing service buildings, owners are allowed to mix and match the options. For example, the Public Housing Authority utility allowance for water and sewer can be used with the agency estimate for electricity. The utility allowance estimates and supporting documents must be retained in compliance with the program's record keeping provisions. The different methodologies. The first one is the Rural Housing Services, also known as the USDA Rural Development Allowance. If the building receives assistance, if the building, the mortgage, or the tenants receive RA from rural housing, the applicable utility allowance for the rent restricted units in the building are applicable for the rural housing utility allowance. So all you would need to do in this situation is when you get your budgets that have been approved with the utility allowances back toward the end of the year, you would just upload that approval in RCRS and there would be no fee. The same is true with the HUD utility allowance. If the rents and the utility allowance are reviewed by HUD on an annual basis, either through submitting to HUD 
or to the contract administrator your rent increases and your utility allowances and they approve them, you would upload that. Or if you do a budget based or the OCAF agreement with the utility allowance, you would upload that as well. And the HUD utility allowance is utilized for the whole building. So once you get that document back, either from HUD or through your contract administrator here in North Carolina would be Quadell, you would just simply upload that in RCRS. And for that utility allowance methodology, there is no fee. The public housing utility allowance, the local PHA allowance must be used for all units. When you do this, you would just simply upload the local housing authority utility allowance in RCRS. And there's no fee for this one as well. A lot of times the utility allowance from the housing authority, your local housing authority will not change from year to year. What you would do at the expiration of your current utility allowance, you would just simply need to like email them or fax them and request, has the utility allowance changed? If they respond back that it hasn't, you would just upload that notification along with the current utility allowance that you're using in RCRS and you would be good for another year. However, if that utility allowance just change in the course of time between the next year, you would need to resubmit with the change once you become aware of that change. And again, there is no fee with that particular utility allowance methodology. The written local estimate and the HUD utility schedule model one, where you use the spreadsheet that's located at the HUD website, both those methodologies will require approval, but also will require $100, $150 fee as we have to review those two methodologies. The energy conservation model is also one that can be used. There is a $150 fee with that. You must use a proper licensed engineer or either a qualified professional. Here we have listed the different licensed and qualified professionals approved by the agency. They're also listed on our website. The agency estimate, this is where you complete the spreadsheet and collect the information using the form on the agency's website. This one also has a $100, $150 fee that must be paid. When submitting the methodologies that do require, when submitting the methodologies that do require the $150 fee to be paid, um, please make sure that this fee is received prior to submitting the utility allowances in RCRS. Um, if the fee is not received in a timely manner, the utility allowance will be returned until the fee is received. So just keep that in mind. And again, if you have any questions with utility allowances, please contact Teresa McSorley. Now we're going to talk about the rental production program, um, often referred to as the RPP program. If you have a loan from our agency, uh, it's part of the RPP program. One of the funds of source that we use are home funds. If you have a home loan from us, you do have to get your lease approved by the Housing Finance Agency. A few reminders are, of course, North Carolina real estate law requires leases to be drafted by an attorney because it's a legal contract. Our agency does require the home units to float throughout the property, so you can't say, these are my home units. And if there's one home unit at the property, then you must use the home lease for all units. The home rent limits, um, if home funds are issued by the Housing Finance Agency, we do approve the maximum allowable rent. Any utility allowance changes also have to be approved by our agency. And if the utility allowance increase causes the home rent limits to be exceeded, rents will likely have to be decreased. The PHA UA must be used for the low income housing tax credit households with vouchers. Although you cannot use that for um, home compliance, you do use that on the tick. Some of the typical loan requirements that you will find if you have a loan from us, we've talked a little bit about um, having to get our approval for rent increases. We're expecting the rent increase to be reasonable, which is typically $15 or less annually. Um, anything that you're asking for that's more than $15 has to be justified. 
And if we do approve a larger increase, we may only allow that for your in-place residents. We are going to make sure that the approved rents are below the applicable set-asides and you're using the standard vacancy rate of 7% regardless of what your vacancy rate is. We are going to compare your budget that you submit with your rent increase request to your actual expenses that are documented in the most recent audited financials. And you have to make sure that you've submitted those audited financials because we will not process the rent increase without it. We do ask that you submit those requests at least 60 days prior to the effective date and that your utility allowance has been approved prior to submission. If your utility allowance is more than nine months old, we may require you to get that updated before processing your rent increase. Any increase that you're requesting is submitted via RCRS after the loan closing, but anything prior to loan closing is submitted to the development staff. <clears throat> if you have not submitted the first request in RCRS, you do need to enter your approved rents from the loan agreement. And then once you've done that going forward, all of your requests will be submitted via um, RCRS as well. A lot of times people say, well, what are you looking for? One thing that we do not allow are any fees that are paid to an investor, such as assets management fees or the syndicator service fees. We realize this is a cost of doing business, but we do not allow you to use these fees to justify your rent increase. We are looking for a 1.15 debt coverage ratio. And if it's more than that, we're going to look at your per unit per year cash flow. And if it's $500 or less, we're typically going to approve your rent increase. But if it's more than that, we may either deny your increase or ask you to decrease the request. If you have our loan, a loan from our agency, you are also required to establish reserve accounts. Those accounts are the rent-up reserve, your replacement reserve, and your operating reserve. Again, you're submitting your audited financials through the system prior to us approving a replacement reserve or any reserve account request. In the future, you can expect to have to submit your supportive housing request through RCRS, but at this point, those are not using the RCRS system. We've provided an email address, actually, excuse me, a website address where you can print the instructions. And if you have questions regarding reserves, you can reach out to Randa. The rent-up reserve is typically funded prior to closing, and you use that to cover your operating expenses during the lease-up. These withdrawals do not require our approval. However, any money remaining in the account after the rent-up has to be deposited to the replacement reserve. For the replacement reserve account, that is funded monthly by installments after closing. You use that for replacement of capital items you do have to have our approval to get money from this account. We require $250 per unit per year for new construction and $350 per year per unit for rehab. And those deposit amounts do escalate by 4% each year. We know that that is not enough to fund the long-term needs of the property. So as a result, it may be that there are times that you submit a replacement reserve request that we will not approve because the property is in a position to cover that. If you want to make a request for money from the replacement reserves, you need to submit your most recent bank statements, your most recent trial balance, and your invoice dated less than 12 months. Any bids, make sure that they're similar in scope and you're not required to accept the lowest bid, but you must explain your choice if you do not choose the lowest one. And routine replacement items such as carpet and flooring can be submitted quarterly or annually. Some of the typical problems we have with withdrawal requests are phase one and phase two must be treated as separate properties, not as a single property. So make sure that you're dividing the expenses appropriately. We will not allow you to withdraw money simply because you're over budget in a given area. So make sure that there is a real need. If you're doing a large request, please do an Excel spreadsheet to help us follow your math calculations. And we do ask that you not submit multiple small requests in a short time frame. Instead, hold them and submit for one large request. And again, if the invoice is over one year, we will not approve the request. Effective October the 1st of 2011, 
There is a minimum balance required in the replacement reserve account of 24 months of the required deposits. If the balance is less than that and you make a request from the account to withdraw money, we may deny the request even though it's a reserve eligible item, if it, even if it's gonna bring it below the um, balance. There are times that we make an exception on a case by case basis, but you have to be able to show extreme adverse financial conditions. Some of the things that we typically approve for withdrawal are appliances, exterior painting, HVAC replacement, office computers, maybe for your office or for the um, community room. Some of the things that we typically do not approve for are interior painting of units, appliance repairs, pressure washing, bed bugs, or replacement of parts on HVAC such as fan motors or AC compressors. For the operating reserve account, that is funded pr prior to the loan closing, and that is typically used for operating deficits during times of economic hardship, such as high vacancies. You do have to get our approval to take money from that account, and prior to taking any owner distribution or payment to investors, that account does need to be replenished. Again, you're gonna submit your most recent reserve bank statement, your most recent trial balance, and proof or detailed explanation of the operating deficit to support your request. Audited financials are required if you have a loan from our agency and you do upload those via RCRS. You can find instructions for that on the welcome screen. If you have questions about the audited financials, you should reach out to Erica Hopkins. Make sure that those audits are prepared in the comparative format. And the data in RCRS needs to be from the audited financial statement and not your year-end management numbers. You need to have them uploaded into RCRS no later than 90 days after the close of the property's fiscal year. Most of you, that is April the 1st. <clears throat> if there are any um, audit findings or identified material weaknesses, we do ask that you include a written response. And remember to include accrued but not yet paid fees such as asset management, incentive management, and owner distributions as part of the audit. Of course, you have to have insurance on your property. You need to make sure that you have insur hazard insurance, which is your fire and extended coverage. That amount needs to be equal to the amount of the loan and coverage that has to be maintained throughout the loan. We're confirming that the property has the property insurance coverage pr prior to closing of the loan but each year you do have to show that coverage has been maintained. You also have to have general liability, um, which covers you for any bodily injury or death on your property or any damages occurring on your, um, or in your premises. Force workers' compensation, you need to make sure that um, companies that do work on your property are covered. We also require a fidelity bond, and that provides protection against loss of money, securities, and properties through any criminal or dishonest acts of an employee. Many of you now do not accept cash for payment on site. Um, you're only accepting checks, money orders, or they can go online and pay. But should you um, have an employee that steals the money orders or the checks or the cash or whatever, this is where you would be um, made whole from that. We do require that the bond be equal to three months of cash flow and the maximum deductible is $10,000. Our agency can require a smaller deductible if we see issues of internal controls. If you have a loan from our agency, there are documents that our agency must approve. We've talked about the lease approval and we do that prior to the loan closing. You need to upload your lease along with the appropriate addendums and RCRS. Both addendums must be completed if both funding sources are applicable. So if you have home and tax credit, Everyone needs to be signing both of those addendums. We're not going to be reviewing the actual lease, so we still encourage you to have that prepared and approved by your attorney. The Affirmative Fair Housing Marketing Plan, that's required prior to loan closing. Again, you're uploading that in RCRS and make sure you're uploading all of the applicable worksheets and other supporting documentation. The Management Plan also is uploaded via RCRS. Your tenant selection plan, 
again, make sure that you're referring to the agency website for the current requirements and important dates. But again, you're uploading this in RCRS with the checklist to show where everything is that's required is laid out in your tenant selection plan. Your tenant participation plan and your grievance procedures, those are only required if the property is a CHODO, meaning operated by a nonprofit. You can refer to our website for the current requirements or any instructions. And if you have questions about those, you can reach out to Sandy and she can help you with that. So now let's talk about the compliance process, which uh, consists of the file reviews and physical inspections. Periodic monitoring reviews are required of the housing programs administered by the agency. The monitoring reviews are conducted to confirm the project meets the rent and income restrictions, the physical conditions, and other program restrictions that are required. File review and physical inspection process. The rough schedule um, would take place by email for the physical inspections. Make sure that your contacts are updated in RCRS, that you have the appropriate people tagged for the um, appropriate responsibilities, such as the physical inspections, who you want contacted in reference to the key or targeting program, financial operations. Um, so make sure that anytime there's changes with your staff, that these are updated for each property. If it's a physical inspection, we will reach out to you by email, typically 30 to 60 days prior to the inspection, just to make sure that we are good with scheduling that. The notification letter will be uploaded in RCRS. If it's a file review, we won't reach you out to you in contact um, prior to the file review, just the physical inspection. With the physical inspection, we'll talk about that more later. The notification letter will be uploaded in RCRS 14 days prior to the inspection, the same with the file reviews. And it's important to make sure, especially for the physical inspections, that the site staff should receive a copy of this notice. It lets them know the date, the time, what type of documents are going to need to be made available at the inspection, and also some tips on how to have a successful inspection. Once the, we will complete the review or the inspection, once that takes place within 30 days, the compliance results letter will be uploaded in RCRS. If a response is required, the owner will be given 30 days to respond. And then once that takes place and your owner response has been reviewed within 30 days, the final report will be issued. And if it was non-compliance cited, that was federal non-compliance with the IRS violations, the 8823s will be issued. A lot of times um, you'll get the final report and there'll be non-compliance that relates to issues where 8823s will be issued. When that takes place and you get that final letter, there's a 14-day window that you'll still see that the inspection the file review is open in RCRS. And a lot of people get confused and think that they need to resubmit their owner's response because maybe it wasn't received. But actuality is this is giving you an additional 14 days to clear up anything that was missed when you submitted your owner's response. So if you forgot to submit something in the file review and you have it and you want to upload it within that 14 days or if it was something that got corrected after that 14 days, um, you weren't able to obtain something from the tenant prior to the response deadline. And so when you submitted that owner's response, that non-compliance was corrected. This gives you that extra 14 days to get that corrected before we send that 8820, 8823 uh, to the IRS. Um, so if you have submitted everything and everything looks fine. There's nothing for you to do. But if there was uncorrected noncompliance, um, that's when you would have an additional 14 days to get that submitted. Um, we will review at least 20% of the low income units, 10% if monitored. Uh, for file reviews, we do not um, do file reviews on the market rate units. 
Um, it's important that when you're uploading a new move in or a recertification into RCRS, that if it is a market rate unit, that you identify it as such. That way we will not pull that unit for physical inspections and we will not pull the unit for file reviews. But you do have to upload the information in RCRS, the unit events. And for the move in, you'll need to upload your supporting documentations just as you would for any other unit. Um, even though it's a market rate unit. Um, if necessary, additional files will be requested and reviewed. And of course, we do this by reviewing the files through RCRS. And once you receive the notification letter, you have 14 days to review, submit the requested file units. The unit event and move-in documents should already be uploaded within 30 days of the unit event in RCRS to avoid non-compliance. The research events should be entered in RCRS within 30 days of the unit event, and documents only need to be uploaded for recertifications if they are requested for a file review, unless the household receives key assistance. So anytime you have a unit event in RCRS that's a move in, recertification, or a move out within 30 days of the unit event, it should be entered in RCRS. If it's a new move-in, you'll upload the move-in documents in RCRS. When you do the recertification unit event, you do not have to upload any documents related to that recertification unless the household receives key assistance. And then if it's a move-out unit event, there's no documents to upload, but you do need to upload, you do need to update RCRS. If a file has been received, been requested, that is, has recertifications, and the recertification is required to be uploaded, you only need to upload the documents for the most recent recertification that was conducted on time. A lot of people ask about the true and accurate as of statement. I know there was a couple years ago, a lot of trainers were telling people, uh, please use um, the true and accurate statement. Some people even went and purchased stamps that said true and accurate as of, and you would write in the date. That is not a correction. The correction is updating the information. So for instance, you had a document that you didn't get completed. You didn't complete the under 5,000 form and you missed it or you can't locate it for a recertification. So you would fill out the true, you would fill out the under 5,000 form and you would have them fill out the information for the date that it should have been filled out. But when they sign it, you would date it with the date that the sign, the form was signed, not you wouldn't backdate it. While we would notate that as a comment or observation, it would not be non compliance because you corrected it yourself prior to the file review. So we're not going to use the true and accurate statement. We're just going to make the correction um, and use the date that they signed it. If you have to make a correction to a form because you wrote the wrong income down, you entered it correctly in RCRS, but you didn't enter it correctly on the form, you would make sure that you enter it correctly um, on the tick. You would just simply mark through whatever information was incorrect and you write the correct information and you would initial and date. There's not a need to use the true and accurate statement that that's obvious that we've made a correction. Looking at the file reviews, let's look at some of the top 10 issues that we find when we do file audits here in at, with the agency. Um, the first one is RCRS does not match the sign and upload the tip. It could be issued with the income. It could be issued with the amount of rent that we have listed or the subsidy. So in this particular example here up top is a tick. We see that the household income is $35,686.32. When we rounded that up and entered it in, into RCRS, we entered it in as $3,586. We left out the first six. So we've missed a number. So we have to make sure that all of our numbers match in RCRS and what we enter in from the ticks that we upload. 
move-in date entered in RCRS does not match the documents. So in the example that we have here on the screen, in RCRS, we've entered in the move-in date of a 6-11-2019, but on the tip, we have an effective date of 7-1-19, and we have a move-in date of 7-14-19. So the effective date should be the same as the move-in date. So in this case, if it were going to be July the 14th, 2019, that would be the date that we would list as the effective date and the move-in date on the tip, but it would also be the exact same date that we would enter in RCRS. They would need to match. What's missing? Not all the documents are uploaded. We understand that uh, you guys upload a lot of documents, especially if you're doing a lease up. Um, you have to upload these documents um, for the move-ins and then for recertifications if it's a file review that has been requested. Just make sure that you use the letter, notification letter that you receive because it will tell you all the items that need to be uploaded. Just make sure that you are using that as a checklist to make sure all of your documents are there. Do you have your application? Is your tip there? Income and asset verifications have been uploaded your lease, your student form, and any required addendum, such as your tax credit lease addendum or the home lease addendum if you have home funds at the property. Make sure all these documents are uploaded. And again, we're all human. It's easy to leave a document out by mistake. The utility allowance is not updated timely. Remember at the beginning when we were talking earlier about the utility allowances, they must be uploaded in RCRS on an annual basis and be approved. When you get your notification for a utility allowance, check over into the document tab where the utility allowance is listed and make sure that you have your current utility allowance updated. Do a self-check, don't wait for us to tell you and get that response that you're not in compliance because you didn't upload your uh, utility allowance. So make sure um, when you have your file review that that's been taken care of. Documents not properly scanned or for the wrong household. So in the example here on the left, we see that in RCRS, we entered this person as Roddy living in this particular unit. When we look at the tick, the person's first name is Danielle. So we uploaded the tick from another household into RCRS. And again, we're uploading a lot of documents into RCRS. We're uploading a lot of individual documents because we remember that the application has to be uploaded separately from the income verifications, separately from the assets, separately from the lease and all your other forms. So uploading so many documents with so many properties, it's very easy to do that. So when you have that 14 day period, Scan and make sure that the documents that you've uploaded belong to the correct households and that everything matches. On the right, we have an example where somebody uploaded a form and it's not legible. If we're not able to read what's on the form that you've uploaded, then we're not able to audit what you've uploaded and we're going to consider it to be missing and we're going to write it up as non-compliance. So check to make sure that everything that you've uploaded is something we can see. By the time the site gets it faxed or emailed and printed from the verification source, then it's scanned and uploaded to the home office and they print it, and they scan it, and then they uploaded it into RCRS. Sometimes the quality of the, the paper um, that's been uploaded um, is not that good. So just make sure that it's something that we can read. unnecessary documents uploaded. We only need the documents that are uploaded into RCRS to be the documents that are listed on the notification letter. Um, make sure that you haven't uploaded anything that's not necessary. If you faxed over the employment verification or the bank verification, we don't need the fax cover sheet. Um, the document's going to have the fax date and time on it that you send it. We'll be able to tell that. That's an unnecessary document that we don't need in RCRS. If you're required, such as you have home funding and you're required to third party verify your assets, such as the banking or checking account, upload that, but you don't need to upload the under 5,000 form. 
Uh, that's dual verifications and we don't need the second verification. A lot of times we will write that up as a comment or observation, ask you not to do that. It's not a necessary form and it can cause conflicts because the more items you upload for us to review in our CRS, the more opportunity for us to find mistakes. I know a lot of management companies, even though they're required to use third-party verification for assets, will still use the under 5,000 form as a third check to make sure that the tenant has disclosed every asset and not left something off on their application. And that's fine, just don't upload that in our CRS. Or if the assets are over $5,000, they'll still have them fill that form out and list everything. And again, in that case, it's not a requirement, but you're more than welcome to do that. Just don't upload it in our CRS. As Sandy mentioned earlier, when she was talking about VAWA, she mentioned that we review VAWA compliance during the physical inspection. So you wouldn't need to upload the VAWA addendums or the VAWA papers into our CRS. And again, the more documents that you upload, the more opportunity for us to cite non-compliance, because if you upload it, we will have to review it. Not documented, it, it's not done. So insufficient source documentation. You have a employment verification and it's not filled out completely. Um, that's insufficient. If you're required to use third-party verification or if you use third-party verification, such as paycheck stubs, you're required to have four to six and you only have two and you're supposed to have two, then you need to document why you only have two and it needs to be a acceptable reason to have two. If you just were only able to get two and so you just submitted two, then that's going to be an issue. If you only have two because the person only has received two paychecks, and that's all they received at the time of move-in, then obviously you can only upload two. But just make sure that if the reason you have two is because that's all you, you received and there was sufficient time in between the time they were on the waiting list and the time that they moved in, that you had additional time to get those additional paycheck stubs that you do obtain those. We do look at those particular dates to, to see. Proper completion of the under 5,000 form. In this example here, we see that the person checked um, PD. He checked box number one that he doesn't have any assets, but then in section number two, he lists assets that he has a checking account. So obviously we have issue there. Also in section two, we see that none of the other items were answered. And remember on any type of form or any type of application, all sections have to be completed. Now you don't have to write in a zero on every line for the savings account, the cash on hand, the certificates. You can draw a line through that column if it's not applicable. But we do need for you to fill in all of the columns. So in this particular example also, we didn't complete the annual income section. So he had $150 cash value for his checking account and a 5.5% interest, but we didn't list the annual income. That caused us when we filled out the bottom of the form for the total annual income from net family assets, we wrote zero. Well, we obviously know that there's an amount. Even though that amount might be under $1, we need to have that filled out on the form. So make sure that the form is completed properly and not using the required agency verification form. Check stubs are the preferred method for employment verifications, and if they're not used, you must use the agency employment verification form found on our website. And not having all the household members 18 and older sign the tick. Again, if your applicant moved in and they have a household member that maybe was 17, and by, they've had a birthday by the time of move-in, make sure you get them to sign the tip. Um, sometimes when they move in at, at, on the application at 17, they stay on the waiting list so long, they can have a birthday. So just make sure you're checking those birth dates and that everyone at the time of move-in that is 18 or older signs the tip. A compliance tip is the income asset calculation worksheet. This form is found on our website under best practices. If you do not show your work 
with the income calculation worksheet, either with our form or some other method using your, your tenant software that you have, uh, we will write that as a compliance, not as a compliance issue, but as a comment and observation. Where it will help you to avoid non-compliance is if we're able to see how you come up with a calculation, then we're able to determine whether that's reasonable or not, and we will not write it up as non-compliance. But if your numbers are way off and we're not able to tell how you calculated the income, then we're going to write that up as non-compliance and ask you to explain that. In this example here, this person or this management company, they used a printout from their tenant software. The issue with this is you see for the Social Security, it just lists the dollar amount. It doesn't tell us how this is calculated. What we're looking for is the monthly amount times 12 equals the annual amount. With Social Security, usually that's a very simple calculation and that's not a hard one to do. Where we need to really see and focus on seeing the work and how you came up with your calculation is more than likely is going to be employment income. Hourly rate times number of hours a week times the 52 weeks. Or if you have a eight or 10 month employee because they work for the school system and you didn't calculate using the 12 months, that's where that's very helpful for us to be able to determine your income calculations. So it's kind of like being in middle school and high school again and the math teacher telling you to show your work, we're asking you to do the same. For physical inspections, um, some reminders for 2020, which will be carried over to 2021 since inspections pretty much are canceled for the remainder of the year through the agency. Just keep in mind going forward um, and in reminders for 2021 for projects awarded credits in 2007 or later, the fire extinguishers or fire stops must be installed in all units and fire stops should not be expired. So check them during your quarterly inspections and budget accordingly. If you've chosen to use fire extinguishers, they must be inspected by a third party, even if you purchase them in bulk. And then for projects that are awarded credits in 2017 or later, recycling amenities are required. If you're not providing this, you must have documentations that the services are not provided by your local waste contractor. So 2017 allocations going forward, you must provide recycled amenities. If you do not, then you need to have documentation from your service provider, whether that's a contracted service provider such as Waste Industries or BFI, or if your trash services are provided by the city, you must have a letter to them saying that these are not offered in your local locality. Um, we see that a lot of times in rural areas and that's fine, you just must be able to document. So keep that in the office and have that available for the inspection. One other note is that properties became smoke-free in 2015. So there shouldn't be any smoking in the units or 25 feet away from the unit of the buildings if you were awarded credits in 2015 and going forward. Um, so make sure that your tenants are complying with that and that you know whether or not your property is bound um, by that. Our entire 2020 monitoring schedule is available in RCRS. It will be the same um, for 2021. Uh, prior to the inspection, we will notify you by email that we're coming out. Normally within 30 to 60 days, we'll give you a date and make sure that that date is good for everyone. Normally when we come out to an area, we're scheduled inspections with multiple management companies. This is to reduce the cost and our resources. So for example, if I'm coming out to Elizabeth City, North Carolina, and I've got six properties, I'm going to try to go to Elizabeth City one time. Um, it wouldn't be um, cost effective and a good use of our resources to make multiple trips. Um, so we ask that when we do schedule these inspections that you do work with us and you do accommodate our requests. Also remember that the tenants um, per the tax credit lease addendum must be given a minimum of 48 hour notice. If you've got something different in your lease where it requires more notice than the 48 hours, that's fine. We also ask that you do not list a time that we will be coming out to the inspection. We might be running late, we might need to be earlier. And if you list a time that takes away that flexibility for that. 
also make sure that you include that the notice of inspection is a random inspection. Um, you do not know the units that we will be inspecting, um, and we don't reveal that to once we're there. So make sure that it's random. Also, one of the benefits of not giving a time is that if there are units that you want to go in after we leave um, to check things and follow up on things, that gives you an, a window of opportunity to do that after we leave units that you don't want us to go in, but you want to go in. If you put down that they're random and you don't give a time, you just say they're going to take place on this particular day, uh, that gives you that opportunity to do that. And that's important. If you look down on your schedule, if you look down at the example, the schedule for this particular property management company is listed and you'll see all their file reviews and their physical inspections for everyone in um, this particular portfolio. If you look under date scheduled, you'll see the month and the year. That's a rough schedule. That's when we're planning to come out to the property, what we've got penciled in for the year. And again, this is going to be in RCRS by the end of January of every year. So in 2021, if you look at RCRS, you should see who's going to do your inspection and what the rough schedule is. Make sure you share this with your staff. Make sure that the regionals and district managers know this. Make sure that the site staff knows this. If there's going to be an issue with the rough schedule month that we've got in the system, please go ahead and let us know that as early as January, if you could. If you know you've got a vacation that's scheduled, let us know so we won't go ahead. We can change that um, rough schedule. Uh, we're more than happy to accommodate in those situations as long as you let us know ahead of time. Once we start scheduling and we get in that month, it becomes a little trickier. Um, if the site staff's not going to be there, that's fine. We still can conduct our inspection with the regional staff. If the regional staff's not going to be there, that's fine. We're still able to conduct that inspection with the site manager. Uh, you're more than welcome to send another regional if the regional is not going to be there or have a site manager from another property come. Um, as long as we've got someone that can let us in the units, that's pretty much all we need. Um, so staff being out once we've started doing the firm scheduling um, is not a reason not to have an inspection at the date that we request. If you look in the example or the date scheduled and you see the exact date and a time, that means it's been firm scheduled. So again, please share this information with your site staff. When we arrive at the inspection, the applicable reports should be made available. That's your fire extinguisher report, your sprinkler inspection, your alarm inspection, backflow, elevator, any other types of inspections that are required to be conducted on an annual basis. These inspections are listed in the letter and again they should be made available prior to the inspection. It's perfectly fine if someone wants to email these reports to us prior to our arrival that way we don't have to worry about collecting them at the inspection, but just make sure that they are available. Once we arrive, there shouldn't be a need to be emailing or calling the home office to have them send or calling the vendor and asking them, can you send this? We should already be prepared prior to the inspection because our notification letter told us what we needed to have. Upon arrival, we'll give you the opportunity to identify units that have issues such as bed bugs, households that provided notifications of illness um, that we would want to go in those units. And in those situations, it's going to be illnesses that are contagious. And then units that are under an eviction. If you tell us a unit has bed bugs, we're going to want to see documentation where you've got treatment plans or appointments scheduled for um, bed bug treatments, what action you've taken. If you've told us that a unit is under eviction, we're going to ask to see the lease termination or the court paperwork showing that it is to make sure that these are units that are actually having issues. So they're units that we wouldn't need to go in. Currently, we use the uniform physical standards um, conditions standards. We know that we'll be transferring to INSPIRE coming up. The inspectable areas, as Sandy mentioned earlier, are the site, building systems, exteriors, common areas, units, and health and safety. So the site is going to be the grounds. The building systems is going to be um, your elevator, going to be 
examples of your fire alarm system or your sprinklers, the exteriors, your siding, your windows, your roofs, common areas, laundry room, fitness centers, meeting rooms, units inside the units. And then the health and safety is going to be items such as your fire extinguishers being out of date or smoke detectors being removed. Keep in mind that if you're in the compliance period, the first 15 years, these issues are reported to the IRS if it is level two and level three. Level one, again, we do is a comment and a concern. Level two and level three are major and severe, and these issues are reported to the IRS per the 8823 audit guide. And we have the link provided here at the bottom of the screen that will tell you the link that you can go and pull the 8823 audit guide. Some examples of the level one, two, and three for a physical inspection is a hole in the wall. So on the left, we have a sheet of notebook paper. Everyone knows the size and what a sheet of notebook paper looks like. If your hole in the wall is minor, meaning that it's smaller than a sheet of notebook paper and it doesn't go through the wall, then it is considered level one. If the hole in the wall is greater than a sheet of notebook paper or larger than a sheet of notebook paper, but it doesn't go through the, both sides of the wall, then it's level two. And level two is reported to the IRS as noncompliance. Level three is going to be a severe hole. It doesn't matter what size the hole is because it penetrates and goes through the wall. Or if you have more than two level two damages on a wall in a room, which really is kind of irrelevant because level two is still reported um, as non-compliance. Health and safety issues are reported to the, um, the IRS and they also must be um, corrected within 24 hours. Again, this is gonna be an example of a missing um, fire extinguisher in a unit or a missing smoke detector. During the inspection, um, the site staff has minimum duties or activities. We're gonna ask that you enter the unit first and let us exit the unit, clearing the apartment, opening all the doors and windows, speaking with the residents if there are any concerns. We're gonna ask you to turn on the oven and the stove top elements and turn them off. And please do not leave them attended until you have turned them off. In the bedrooms, we're gonna be inspecting the windows. We're gonna ask that you open the blinds and raise the window, and then we will shut and lock the window for you to make sure that they are operable. During the inspection, we will allow you to make minor repairs. That is a difference from the REACT inspection. In a REACT inspection, if you have a deficiency, they will write it, and even if you correct it, it's still a deficiency. With the agency inspection, if you make a correction, we'll make it as an observation, but we won't report it to the IRS, and we won't cite it as being non-compliance. We allow you to make minor repairs in a unit. If it doesn't slow down the inspection, if you don't have to go back and get repairs and you have the items you need with us, with you during the inspection. If during the inspection we see that there's a lot of repairs that need to be made, we'll have to stop making those repairs and we'll just have to start citing these as non-compliance. Um, we're not waiting until the inspection to start making repairs, we should have done our inspection. Prior to our inspection, there should have been a pre-inspection and these things should have been caught. So if we see that that's not the case, then we're just gonna start writing up the non-compliance and not allow maintenance to make the repairs. And here's a list of different items that you could bring with you that you can make minor repairs rather quickly. Our inspections are a result, um, a snapshot in time. We must record what we see during the inspection. If it's there, it must function. We must inspect all areas of the apartment. So if we go into a unit and the bedroom is not available to be inspected, then the bedroom fails the inspection is out of compliance. If there's someone in the bathroom and we're not able to inspect the bathroom, then the bathroom is, fails the inspection and it's out of compliance. Um, on the left, we see that these urinals aren't working, so that would be non-compliance because we have a urinal that's inoperable. Um, you might have already called the plumber and the plumber couldn't get there before the inspection, but it's 
he's on his way and he's going to be there tomorrow because it's not functioning properly at the time of the inspection, then we're going to need to cite that as not compliance. And then if a resident is using their own air conditioner, refrigerator, or freezer, it must be inspected. Deficiencies won't be noted as not compliance, but we will notate them as a concern or observation. Effective January the 1st, 2014, accessibility not compliance issues will result in 8823 being issued. Um, Russ Griffin normally does our initial inspection um, for rehabs and for new construction. When he comes out, um, any issues that he discovers um, during that inspection, he typically will write up as non-compliance. Um, he's going to measure your sidewalks um, and, and different accessibility issues. He has the equipment. He can measure slopes, the rulers, and all that types of stuff. Um, when we come out and do our inspection from the asset management side of it, we're not going to have those tools, but if we notice something that is an accessibility issue um, that's very obvious, then we will write it up. That's going to be a sidewalk missing um, to an amenity. So if you had a gazebo and there was no sidewalk to make it accessible, then that's an obvious accessible issue. If you've got a playground and there's no accessibility to it, then that is an issue. If you have multiple amenities, only one of them have to be accessible. And if that's not the case, um, we would cite that as not compliance. Um, in the laundry room, we're going to be looking, you know, it's obvious if you don't have at least one washer that's a front loader. Those are the issues that we're able to tell without having all the equipment like Russ does. Um, pretty matters effective August the 1st, 2016, all repairs to address the UPCS deficiencies in preparation for an inspection should be made in good and workmanlike manner with materials that are suitable for the purpose and free from defects. Um, this is commonly referred to as the national industry standard. On your REACT inspection, you'll see NIS notated frequently. That's because repairs have been made and they're not proper repairs. An um, example is a drywall repair of the sheetrock with mud and tape is the correct means for the repair. Simply covering the hole or the damage area with plywood or laminate is not a correct repair. It's got to be a finished repair. It's got to look like the repair was never made and that it's in its original state. Um, if you put in a, a plumber's access panel, panel, that access panel needs to be there for a purpose. It's not to be used as a form just to patch holes in the wall. So if we come in an apartment and we go in a utility room and there's four access panels, that's not a proper repair. Um, so we're going to be looking for that. We're going to be looking for the repairs made to doors, sheet rocks. Um, any type of repair is going to need to be made to the national industry standards. So make sure when repairs are made and work orders that you're randomly going back in the units and following up on those repairs and spot checking some of those repairs to make sure that your maintenance staff and your vendors that you've hired have made good repairs. When we're looking at amenities, they must function as intended. They must be online and available to residents, and they must be accessible. If you have an offline or new amenity installed, you must have written permission from Susan Westbrook by emailing her. In this picture here, we have a computer lab or a business lab, and there's no computer. When your owner submitted their application, they listed what amenities they were going to provide, and they have to provide those amenities. They must function at all times, or it's non-compliance. They must be available to the tenants, or it's non-compliance, and it must be accessible, handicap accessible, um, for all the tenants to be able to use um, the amenities. And again, if it's offline or out of repair or being removed, then it is non-compliance unless you have that documentation from Susan Westbrook. It needs to be kept in the office and it needs to be made available um, at the inspection. If you have unwanted to amenities and you removed um, those amenities again, you must have permission from Susan Westbrook. So if you have a playground and you're not going to use it anymore and you want to remove it, you must have permission. If you've got a basketball court and now it's created a hangout and loitering and drug activity and you want to remove it, that's fine. 
um, you must have that permission from West Cities of Westbrook. Keeping in mind about your yearly building inspections, each year the owner must have various third party inspections of the systems. They could include the elevator, sprinkler alarms, and backflows, um, backup generator chillers, and hot water boilers, um, fire extinguishers. Um, you must have those available. And it must be um, all the repairs that were noted on it must be have been made. You need to have work orders showing that if something was found to be a deficiency, such as on your sprinkler system, that it's been repaired. That could be a work order from your maintenance staff. It could be a work order from a third party vendor or either a reinspection noting that these have been repaired. Our vacant unit policy, um, all the units that are vacant over 30 days must be rent ready and have all the repairs made in them. There is no 48 hour rule where you need to have the carpet clean prior to someone moving in and you're going to wait and do that right before move in. Um, the carpet has to be cleaned and ready once you hit that 30 day period. And we will inspect all the vacant units that have been vacant over 30 days. Each deficiency we observe in a unit will be recorded as non-compliance, even if in an occupied unit, something would be notated as a comment or concern or level one. In a vacant unit after 30 days, it's automatically written up as a level three. So in this picture here, we have a refrigerator and it has the door handle on it. But if the door handle was missing in an occupied unit, that would be a level one. But because this unit here is vacant, if the door handle was missing, that would be a level three because the unit is not totally rent ready. So make sure that you're inspecting these vacant units on a regular basis, um, especially prior to our inspections to make sure that they are actually 100% rent ready for someone to move in. Is hoarding a deficiency? We know that hoarding is now considered to be a health um, a disability. So therefore, when we do our inspections, if we see hoarding, we do not write up the hoarding itself as a deficiency. We write up the effects of the hoarding. Excessive garbage and debris stored inside the unit, creating strong odors, or if it causes a bug infestation or other sanitary issues, then we will write that up as the deficiency, but not the hoarding. Clothes thrown all over the unit itself is not a deficiency, but if it's blocking the path of travel and creating a trip and fall hazard, then that is the deficiency. Dirty dishes in the sink, that's a housekeeping issue, and we will not write it up as a deficiency or non-compliance, but we will write that up as a housekeeping concern. Um, in this picture here, it's a little junky in this utility room here. That's not the issue, but because the blocked egress is present. We've got the clothes, the door is blocked by that box, and then the little four-wheeler is blocking the door. So the hoarding is not the deficiency, it's the effects where the hoarding is caused there to be blocked egress. So we would write that up as non-compliance. We talked about earlier that the gray areas and the miscellaneous guidance for tips for a successful inspection is going to be sent with the notification letter. And again, please make sure that your site staff gets a copy of the notification letter with these attachments. These are good tools for your maintenance staff and your site staff, management staff, to use to prepare for the inspection. When they're doing their quarterly inspections, it's a good tool. It lets them know what we're looking for when we do an inspection. And again, keep in mind that these forms are going to be updated when we start back doing our physical inspections in 2021. Some of the gray areas that's included, it's going to be items that are not in the 8823 audit guide, but we will issue non-compliance for. And because it's not in the 8823 audit guide, we issue the non-compliance as state non-compliance. Um, so 8823 might not be issued, but you still have to make the corrections. Example is going to be aluminum foil on drip pans and all those items that are considered the gray areas are listed in that attachment. 
keep in mind that if you've gotten copies before in 2021, when we start back doing the inspections, that they're going to be updated. So you'll need to redistribute these to your staff. Let's look at some of the top 10 issues that we find when we go through these physical inspections. The trip hazards in the dwelling units and outdoor. We know we can have trip hazards inside the apartment, but we can have them in the common areas as well. In this picture on the left, we had the cable cords uh, from the satellite running across. That's a trip hazard. We also have erosion that's exposed roots in the common areas, in the walk in the areas. Um, you see that in the back of the picture and up close. That's considered non-compliance, and both these issues need to be addressed. On the right, inside the unit, we know about the cords that are across the floor, but also in this apartment, we have the steps that are damaged, and that's created a trip and fall hazard. Blocked or missing dampers on exterior exhaust vents. So here we see on the right, the damper is missing on the right, the cover is missing on the left. Additionally, make sure that these are cleaned out on a regular basis um, as they can prevent um, cause fires. Um, so you want to make sure that these are addressed. Mold and mildew observed in the unit um, is also something that we see a lot of. Make sure that you're looking into your closets where your water heater and your air conditioner is in to make sure that you don't have any moisture issues. Also check under kitchen cabinets and bathroom cabinets. We a lot of times find mold and mildew there where we repair the leak, but we need to address the damage that's been caused by the leak um, to make sure it's not there. And again, that's part of the um, pretty matters area where the national industry standards said we're making the repair, we need to repair um, the walls, the cabinets, or, or any other damage that's taken place. Blocked emergency egress, um, that could be inside the apartment or outside the apartment. Here in the picture on the left, we have a bookcase blocking the window. And then on the right, we've got overgrown shrubbery that's blocking the egress from the outside. We've got to make sure that our residents can get out of the unit if there's a fire or a danger. And we need to make sure that first responders are able to get into a, a unit if there's a fire or they need to make an emergency rescue. You have to have in each bedroom, you have to have at least one window that is unblocked and can be used as emergency egress. So if you have two windows in a room, one can be blocked, one cannot be blocked. Three, the same thing. Two can be blocked, one cannot be. You just have to make sure that we have at least one window that you can get out of. And we have to make sure that the door leading into the unit can be opened fully and is not hindered because there's furniture behind it or anything like that. Water heaters, um, if you have a water heater that's been damaged and leaking, that's non-compliance. You need to make sure that once the repair has been made, that there's rust left, that that is cleaned up as well, because if you have a new leak, you won't be able to tell that you have a leak until maybe it's too late. Um, and there's nothing worse than having a, a busted water heater that leaks and, and nobody's home to report it. And then also make sure that your water heater has the pressure relief pipe. Especially if you have a water heater that's replaced, make sure your maintenance person or the contractor or vendor that you have installed that, make sure they install that pressure relief pipe and that's not forgotten. Flammable material stored in the apartment. Make sure that we don't have match light, gas, or anything else that's flammable stored inside of an apartment or storage unit on the patio. They can store the match light on the patio, but they can't store it in the unit. If there's four walls and a roof, then you can't have flammable material stored. But if there's three walls, then you can if one of the walls is open. Also make sure that you remember that if you have a tenant that has a moped or a motorcycle that they don't have it stored within 25 feet of the building it needs to be stored in the parking lot. Any gas powered objects, um, devices such as that of a motorcycle cannot be stored within 25 feet of the building. Um, also keep in mind with propane tanks as well, they're not allowed. Broken window doors, and door seals, fog, and condensation observed. So the picture on the right, we have a broken window. On the left, we have condensation. Um, these are examples of non-compliance that will be cited during our inspection. 
full absorbed under the stove, heating element or drip pans or wrap. So we talked about this just a moment ago. This is state non-compliance because this is not in the 8823 audit guide, but it's still an issue that must be corrected. In this picture on the left, we have on the right burner, we have the drip pan wrapped in aluminum foil. We do not allow that in North Carolina. And then the large element on the left, we see that they've installed a disposable foil pan and we do not allow that in North Carolina. On the oven, we have a piece of parchment paper, it appears, under the baking element. We do not allow anything under that baking element. We don't allow tinfoil, parchment paper, the little disposable pans that you can purchase, or silicon mats to be installed. If you want to use one of those pan liners that people use, you can put it on the shelf, but you cannot put it under the element. And also, you cannot wrap your oven racks in aluminum foil as well. All that will be issues of state noncompliance. Bedroom and bathroom doors that do not close, latch, and lock. So obviously, the door on the left is not going to latch when you close it or lock because the doorknob is hanging down. And then the door on the right is off the hinge, so it's not going to lock as well. Also, there's a hole in the door, and so that is a level three finding. Um, because that is a door to the bedroom or bathroom. Missing or operable smoke detectors, so if the battery is missing or if the device is missing it's, it, itself, um, make sure that you have that taken care of. And of course, we ask that you bring some on the inspection, but if they're missing and they do not function as intended, um, we will write that as non-compliance. If you have a smoke detector that's missing the battery, and it's hardwired and still would test, we still will write that up as non-compliance, even though it's still would test, because if the building were to lose power, then it would need the battery back up in order to sound the alarm to warn the attendants that they need to vacate their unit. So make sure that it has the battery and make sure that the device is there. That's a health and safety issue that requires to be fixed within 24 hours. With your physical inspection non-compliance response, we have to provide, you need to provide that information to us within 30 days of the date that you receive your notification of um, results letter. You're going to always see that we have included the language of provide a work order invoice along with pictures documenting the correction. That is a standard response for the correction that we will put into the letter. There are sometimes that a work order and invoice is needed and sometimes a picture is needed. Do not upload a copy of the visit response letter. We already have a copy of it uploaded in RCRS so we don't need to add duplicates into um, RCRS. Some people want to know when do you need to send a an invoice or a work order or when do you send a picture. Um, you wouldn't need to send both in most cases unless it's been asked for. You would send an invoice or a work order anytime that a repair is made in the apartment that you would need to have a repair made by your maintenance staff or third party contractor. An example of that is going to be a door had to be replaced or a handle on a refrigerator had to be replaced that we talked about earlier. Any type of repair work or replacement that's made in the apartment that your maintenance staff does or a third party vendor or contractor does, you would submit the invoice or the work order. You would submit a picture in most cases if it's something that needs to be addressed in the apartment that the tenant is responsible for. For example, if you had a window that was blocked that you didn't unblock during the inspection, it is your tenant's responsibility to remove that item that's causing the block egress. Even if your maintenance staff may help them, the tenant is ultimately responsible for their belongings in the unit. You wouldn't put that on a work order. You would simply take a picture of the window that's not blocked. The same if they had a cord across the doorway um, creating a trip hazard. Your maintenance man wouldn't be the one more than likely that would um, remove that cord, the tenant would, so you would take a picture of it. And that's when you would use a picture. 
and make sure that the invoice or the work order includes the date that the work was completed. Or if you submit a picture, make sure there's some type of date on it. So if it's date stamp, make sure the date's correct. If you uploaded a picture, make sure you write with a permanent marker or Sharpie the date that it's completed. That's not as important in the middle or the beginning of the year, but that date becomes very important at the end of the year or when you're submitting a compliance resolution packet. Because if you don't have a date, we're going to use the date correction that's going to be listed on the 8823 on that date corrected line as the date that it was uploaded. And if you've uploaded that in the next year, so if we did the inspection in 2019 and you uploaded in January of 2020, we're going to show that the corrected date is going to be in January. That means that on December the 31st, your unit was out of compliance and you lose credits at that time. So make sure you're using the correct date. And again, that's really important, especially towards the end of the year um, or if you're submitting a compliance resolution packet, that becomes important because again, that's we're gonna list on that 8823, we're gonna list the date that you were out of compliance and the date that you are back in compliance. And that can be very important when we're involved in the end of the year with the 1231. A lot of times, if it's a major repair, instead of submitting the documentation that has been completed, someone will submit a bid or proposal. And that is not satisfactory documentation that the non-compliance has been corrected. That's just, we've gotten bids, but the work's not been done. We cannot close out the non-compliance for at a physical inspection until the work has been completed. If you're unable to get it completed by the expiry, by the response time, that 30 day period, then you can typically, we, in most cases, we will allow a 30 day extension. After that, we'll need to go ahead and close out the non-compliance as uncorrected, but submit a plan of action. That way it won't show that you have, you'll have uncorrected non-compliance, but you have a correction plan in place to fix it. Once that's been completed and the final report's been issued, then you'll be able to go back and submit that compliance resolution packet at a later date. If you receive an error message that your file is too large when you're uploading that non-compliance, make sure that your file size is not too large. A lot of times that happens because people are uploading unnecessary documents with their physical inspection response. They're uploading a copy of the letter, which we indicated we didn't need a copy of the letter. And they're trying to upload pictures and invoices, too many documents um, to show the correction. And we don't need that. So make sure that you're only providing what has actually been requested and what's actually needed to show that the non-compliance has been corrected. The affirmative marketing is our next section we're going to cover. Properties financed by the North Carolina House of Finance Agency must have um, affirmative action marketing plans in place. It needs to state in the least the criteria that the property will comply with the state and federal housing laws, identify the methods to market to persons with disabilities and populations least likely to apply. So in your marketing plan, when you list that you're going to reach out to certain populations that are underserved that don't match the demographics of your community. How are you going to do that with your contact letters and newspapers that you're going to advertise in? And then how are you going to apply your screening criteria uniformly? You must display an approved affirmative fair housing marketing plan, the HUD form 93.93.5.2a in the leasing office and make it available to the public upon request. Keep in mind this form has an expiration date of 2011 previously, and it's been updated now that it expires January the 31st, 2021. So make sure that you're using the correct and current form and that you have uploaded your copy in RCRS. The tenant selection plan defines who's eligible to live at the apartment complex at the community. That's going to mean if it's elderly or if you're only renting to disabled persons or if it's a family property. It must be in writing, it must define applicable and or 
unacceptable criteria related to the landlord references, your credit checks, criminal history, your sex offender check, occupancy standards, eligibility requirements, the definition of elderly if it's, a, if it's applicable in your appeals process. So again, make sure that you have your tenant selection plan, make sure that the copy that you've had approved by the agency and that is in, uploaded in RCRS is the copy that's posted in the office as well. We will be looking for that. The agency has developed a model criminal policy in connection with the Fair Housing Center. Owners and managers must generally conform to the guidance memo dated 3-19-2018 that's been uploaded in RCRS under the announcements. New properties placed in service on or after January the 1st, 2019 must submit the new plan that meets the requirements. Existing properties which have approved tenant selection plans based on the agency's tenant selection plan policy published on 7-5-2016 are required to update the plan to comply with the new requirements later in January, no later than January the 1st, 2021. So don't forget that back in 2016, we had everyone redo their tenant selection plan. We've added updates to that. So if you submitted one after January the 5th, 2016, you're going to need to make sure that you resubmit a plan that meets the new requirements that were published on January, I'm sorry, on March the 19th, 2018. And your plans must be again uploaded in RCRS and posted in the office. And the same plan that's uploaded in RCRS is the plan that should be posted in the leasing office. The tenant selection plan policy applies to all properties, not just those properties with the RPP loans or home funding from the agency. Now we're gonna talk about the um, DHHS targeting program and the key rental assistance associated with those units. In order to be a um, part of the targeting program, you do have to be eligible. Um, you do receive a referral letter from DHHS. You can find out about the targeting program training on our website. As of right now, we don't have any in-person training scheduled the rest of the year, although we will be putting an online course available similar to this one here. So if you'll just watch our website for that. Here's a sample of our referral letter. Uh, each participant must have a program letter of referral and it needs to be the most current version, which includes the bedroom size. And of course, there are other eligibility requirements to determined by the type of assistance they receive. If they receive key rental assistance, the head of household must have an income based um, on disabilities such as SSI, SSDI, or veterans benefits. The total household income cannot exceed the state mandated 50% area median income. The minimum gross income, of course, is $300 a month, and the household meets um, the bedroom size standard. If they have other rental assistance, such as RD or project-based rental assistance, the verification of disability or homelessness status is according to those um, program rules. And of course, the household income requirements are also according to the rent assistance associated with that program that they're associated with. There are various type of waivers that you may have with the targeting program. You may have a unit size waiver, which allows them to have a larger unit, an income size waiver, which allows them um, to live in your unit, making more money, but um, waiving some of that income based on medical expenses or things of that nature. Disability waiver where DHHS has been able to confirm their disability, but because they have not received a um, hearing yet from Social Security, they're using it from a qualified professional. And also the North Carolina Transitions Program waiver Again, ultimately, regardless of waivers that are received from DHHS, just make sure that management is um, verifying program eligibility. The transitions waiver is essentially a waiver from DHHS that they're telling you the amount of income to use on the tick, and you're only completing one tick. And the waiver letter tells you that you're going to use that amount to calculate the subsidy and tenant rent portion for the first 120 days. You're going to enter a move-in unit of in an RCRS, and you're going to do an income override of $1. Then you're going to upload all your documents as you would any other move-in unit event, including this waiver. And again, all documents are completed at move-in and entered in 
RCRS that move in. The letter also is going to tell you that after the first 120 days, an amount to use to determine rent and subsidies share. You're going to do a second key lease addendum, a second key calculations worksheet, and also upload this waiver. You're not going to do another tick. You're only going to do an additional key lease addendum, a key calculation worksheet, and upload the waiver. And the amounts on the form should reflect the amounts in the waiver and in RCRS. You do not have to do an income override for the update unit event referenced in the waiver. Again, you're completing all of these documents that move in. You're not waiting until you know, the 120 days are up, but if you have any questions about how the information should be entered, you can reach out to our staff and we'll be more than happy to help you navigate the system changes. There are times when households need live-in aids. Management should still screen these um, live-in aids for um, criminal history. Keep in mind that a spouse can never be your live-in caregiver or live-in aid and additional family members are not allowed to live in the unit. For example, if I am the live-in aide of my mother, my children cannot also live in the unit. I am the only one needed there. I am the only one that can live there. Also, should I move in um, an apartment with my mom, we're, you know, co-household, head of households, everything's good, and then all of a sudden my mom needs a live-in aid, I can no longer become the live-in aide. Once I move in, you start out like you, um, as a household member, you continue as a household member. I could not become the live-in aid later. Should there be a need for a live-in aid and you're in the unit and then the need no longer is there, the live-in aid no longer qualifies to live in the unit. The live-in aid is no longer eligible also if they bring other family members to live in the unit. If you marry the household member or the live-in aid moves out, there's no longer a need there. As we talked about earlier, the key rental assistance is state funded to subsidize the rents of tenants referred by the targeting program. It is limited to households headed by persons with disabilities and it's verified by income based on disability. The payment standard is set by our agency and DHHS. Again, the owner has to sign an agreement of participation and management does have to verify eligibility and submit monthly for requisitions for key rental assistance to be paid. Um, here we show you what the base key payment standards are based on bedroom size. Um, the payment standards did increase in January of 2019. They did not increase in 2020. Um, there's been no discussion as of yet for 2021. But keep in mind, any rent increase that HFA approves um, for your property does not increase the key payment standard. When you're verifying key rental assistance eligibility, you need to look at the referral letter. Is it signed and is it complete? Is there a minimum of $300 a month income? And the disability source only has to be $1. They have to have a total of $300, but disability source only has to be $1. It does need to be a federal source or state, SSI, SSDI, or veterans benefit. And again, the household income cannot exceed the state mandated 50% of area median income. And the household size meets the required bedroom size standard, which is now noted on the referral letter. On a monthly basis, you need to go into RCRS and request the um, rental assistance for the property. You're going to go to the property and click on the blue rental assistance tab beside the property and then submit. Anything that you have submitted during the week, we review and process by Wednesday um, of the following week. However, we do have up to 30 days from the date that you make the request to process the payment. On a daily basis, we encourage you to go into RCRS and enter in any of your unit events. Make sure that the rental assistance and the key assistance is calculating correctly and make sure all of your documents are uploaded and make sure everything matches your documents that's in RCRS prior to com clicking complete into the system. Here's a list of the required documents that move in. Keep in mind that you will not always have a waiver letter 
and you will not always have the home calculation worksheet if there are no home funds on the property. And the same applies to the home lease addendum. If there are no home funds on the property, you would not need that, need that home lease addendum. At recertification, we're also, there's some list of documents that you need to upload. We do encourage you to go back and look at the move-in file before completing the recertification to see if there's a waiver letter, if there were any instructions that you needed to reach out to DHHS, see if there's any change in income sources, bank accounts, things of that nature. If there's an increase in the household's income that could impact the household's um, amount of rent that they pay, if the tenant income and rent share, it has to be calculated annually. The resulting amount will be included in the lease or the key lease addendum. Income increases above 50% area median income does not impact eligibility. The tenant rent share um, simply increases proportionate to the increase of the income. If the increase results in the tenant share exceeding the key payment standards, the property management company will continue to calculate the tenant's rent share using the key formula until the household is at the standard rent associated with the housing credit income targeting level for the particular unit. And make sure you are adhering to any additional funding rules as it pertains to the housing credit income limits. All files receiving key rental assistance must be submitted within 30 days of unit event, and we will process them within 30 days. Keep in mind that any return files delays the process and it starts the clock over. So if you submit your file on September the 1st, we have until October the 1st to process. If we return it on September the 15th and you return it back to us on September the 20th, the 30 days again starts on September the 20th. If you have any questions as it relates to um, the targeting units or the key rental assistance, you can reach out to myself for questions on getting the property set up or any targeting unit agreements. If you have questions on the file review process or any billing or payment questions, you can reach out to Louise Gardner. Okay, for vacancy and referral, this is where you're reporting your vacancies in the system so that DHHS knows that there are units available. Management is gonna to have to provide their staff access to RCRS in order for them to be able to um, access in vacancy and referral. So that's something the management company will be required to do. Make sure that you're checking their box to report vacancies when you're giving your staff access. If not, they will not be able to report vacancies. Management enters the vacancy to start the process. If you don't enter a vacancy, you don't receive a referral. All of your vacancies need to be entered, including your market units, and you should enter your vacancies as soon as you're notified. For new properties, you need to reach out to DHHS prior to reporting your vacancies. DHHS will let you know what unit size they have a need for, and then you can determine um, working with them what you need to enter in. Again, touch base with DHHS prior to entering your vacancies, especially if the property is a rehab, because all of your residents need to be rehoused in rehabbed units before you start reporting vacancies. For ISHP properties, make sure you're communicating with the LME, MCO, and DHHS as it relates to which prop vacancies to enter, and Kay Johnson is your contact for those properties. When you're entering into Vacancy and referral, you need to make sure that you know the characteristics of your units as it relates to the accessibility features. It's very important that you report accurate information to DHHS. What makes a unit accessible? If it has a roll-in shower, that means the unit's fully accessible. If it has wider doors and grab bars, that means it's a handicapped accessible unit. And if it has assistive technology, that means there's visual and audio accessible features in the unit. When we ask if the unit has more than one floor, we mean inside the unit. Like, is it a townhouse? It's like the living room downstairs and the bedrooms upstairs. When we say, are there exterior stairs? That means, are there steps that you have to go up to, to access the unit? That can be one step, up a landing, and then walk in the door, or it can be several steps. You also, of course, need to report if there's elevator access, and then if 
you do report a unit that is available and there's an ele elevator at the property, you need to tell us which floor it's on. You'll notice on um, the screen, you'll see the little red asterisk. If you hover over those asterisks, it'll give you some information as it relates to the question. The housing assessor, once you submit the, refer the vacancy, will acknowledge your vacancy within five business days. And then they're gonna provide the property with a referral and the appropriate waiver letter if it applies. Just because they don't provide you a referral doesn't mean you can lease that unit to someone else. They still have that unit for 30 days. When they add the referral, this is what they see on their side. This is what they're entering. If your targeting requirement is met, you're still going to enter the vacancy, but you're going to ask DHHS to immediately release the unit and DHHS should do so within five days. Here's what the screen will look like when you request the release. And then you notice on um, DHHS's side, they get the message, then they either can release the vacancy or deny the request. Once DHHS sends a referral to the property, you're basically waiting for them to contact you. So the status is now pending contact. DHHS still has access if the person doesn't respond, but typically they're going to respond within five days. If they don't show up within five days, you need to update vacancy and referral to let DHHS know that the person did not show up. And you'll notice that all of this back and forth is in vacancy and referral, so it can be documented as to what um, took place on what date and how much time elapsed in the meantime. Again, you're letting DHHS know, hey, you sent me a referral, I haven't heard from them, where do we go from here? And this is what the screen would look like, where you would either submit the application if they, you let DHHS know the person submitted an application, or where you would um, request contact status follow-up because they have not shown up. DHHS will then de determine, okay, the person didn't show up, they're gonna reach out to their referral agency and say, you know, is the person still interested in the unit? If they're still interested, DHHS will revive the referral. If they're not, DHHS will close the referral. If DHHS closes the referral, this doesn't necessarily mean that they have no one else for the unit. That just means that person is no longer going to be there. The person applies, again, you're notifying DHHS of the application. You're gonna update vacancy and referral if it's um, insufficient information. Remember, you're not charging the household any application fees and you're following the approved tenant selection policy. If something's missing from the application, you need to notify the applicant and you need to update vacancy and referral with a comment of what's missing. That way DHHS can know what's missing and kind of know the status and follow up if needed. DHHS gets notification of all the comments. Should they get any comments, this is what they get notification of in the system so they'll know that you have put something in the system. The application gets approved. You need to update vacancy and referral with the approval status and decide what the move-in date's gonna be. Here's the screen where you're going to approve the application. And then you're going to reserve the vacancy, basically, tell DHHS and tell the system this is the unit that this person's moving into and what their expected move-in date is. Here you're reserving the vacancy and you're telling them the expected move-in date. Now if the unit the person's moving into is not in this list here, that means you have not reported that vacancy or either DHHS has released that vacancy. Make sure that you're reserving the vacancy for the right person. Don't just pick something so you'll have a unit. It needs to be the right unit that they're moving into. Of course, we have people change their mind. If they change their mind, you need to undo the reservation and choose another one or withdrawal of application. This is what the screen would look like where you have the options to either confirm, undo, or withdraw the application. All right, the person's moving in, they come in, they sign all of their documentation, and then you're gonna confirm the move-in date and vacancy and referral. Make sure that you're updating the information in um, RCRS because the two systems do not talk to each other. 
Also answer any questions prior to signing the lease and moving them in. If you have any questions for our staff or with DHHS, make sure you've done that prior to the lease signing as well. When you're confirming the move-in, this is where you're putting in the move-in date and you're choosing the building and the unit that they actually moved into. Keep in mind when you, um, your referral letter needs to show that the bedroom size of the household's eligible to lease. So if the referral letter says they're eligible for a one bedroom and you try to choose a two bedroom in RCRS or in vacancy and referral, it's not gonna work. It's gonna give you an error message. If the referral letter says there's two people in the household and they come to apply and there's five, you need to let DHHS know that prior and make sure you're updating vacancy and referral all along and not waiting until the end. And again, we can't stress the importance of letting the housing assessor or NCHFA know any questions before you sign the lease. If you have questions regarding payment or file issues, you can reach out to Louise. If you have questions about how to use vacancy and referral, you can reach out to Wanda Teal. If there are technical issues with vacancy and referral, meaning it's not working as intended, you can reach out to me. Now, if you don't know how to work vacancy and referral, that's a Wanda Teal question. Again, this is a DHHS system and they're the ones that can help you navigate that. But if you're getting an error message and should not be, if you'll reach out to our team, we can let our IT staff know and they can assist you with that. A few of the things that we think are important that you and your team are aware of is that we think it's important that you have a project data file for every one of your properties. That's essentially a notebook that gives some history about your property, um, includes the QAP from when the property was awarded, a copy of the 8609, maybe information on your most current approved rents, your most current approved utility allowances. This will help someone coming to your property know how they should be working to get your property leased and managed. If you have staff that work at two different properties, if the properties were funded in different years and have different funding sources, they can very well need to be managed in different ways. So make sure we encourage you to have a project data file for each property. The courtesy training resources, we encourage you to share those with your staff, all of your staff. It's good information to have and it's also a good point of reference. Any of our training opportunities, we will be posting on our website as those get published virtually. Um, we do hope soon to be able to go back to in-person trainings, but until then, we will be posting our trainings online. All properties should be listing their properties on NC Housing Search. This is a free reporting service for vacancies, and we refer people to this website when they call our office asking about available vacancies. So make sure your property is doing that. We also encourage you to have a copy of the 8823 audit guide available for all of your staff. Make sure each property has a copy of this. There's a lot of good information in there as it relates to um, non-compliance and how to get that addressed and what's considered non-compliance. You should also keep copies of the most current income and rent limits. Yes, they are available in RCRS, but we do encourage you to print those out periodically in case there should be some sort of system issue and you move somebody in based on um, income and rent limits that we provided to you. If they were incorrect, we would not cite you for non-compliance. The Rental Compliance Reporting System, also known as RCRS, it's very important that your staff are familiar with this and how to navigate throughout. You can go to our website or reach out to Tanya Clark for information about RCRS, gaining access and training materials as it relates to that for doing various functions within that reporting system. So we do encourage you to make sure that your um, team is aware of that. This is the end of our presentation. Um, we do encourage you to reach out to our staff if you have any questions. Feel free to contact us via email or by phone. And again, Stephen and I thank you for your time today.